She did a catalogue with her husband and invited them so that she could also have more direct session for you to make it easier. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Welcome to, to sorry. You want to Hello. Welcome to today's session. I hope you, you had a restful weekend. Karibuni sana. My name is Dr. Roda Kalondo from Quality Healthcare Department, KNH. And today we're going to have case scenarios from Dr. Lois Cheng and Dr. Maritim Beth, who are very influential, who are very influential in development of the clinical care guidelines that we have for Kenya. And the topic for today's Zoom discussion is appropriate response to various clinical scenarios. Kindly remember to put your microphones or your audio on mute. And uh, also remember to put your questions on the chat box and any concerns that you might have, also put them on the chat box. Dr. Lois, Karibu. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll really just present a few case scenarios. And the reason why we're doing this is one, we know many of you are being called by various people to advise on various things. Many of you may have concerns. So the presentation is actually going to be very short. And the aim is to allow uh, as many of you as possible to ask questions uh, that hopefully Dr. Maritim and I will answer. Uh, as we go along. So this will be short, then after that, we'll just open up for people to ask as many questions as possible. So as we go on, you can now uh, post any questions that you may have so that we handle them at the end of this. Okay, so we'll dive straight into the case scenarios. One, even before we go on, I hope you all have a copy of the guidelines. If you don't have a copy of the guidelines, you can send a message to Dr. Kalondo so that after this, those can be forwarded to you because these are really lifted from the guidelines. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slides, but okay, there it is. So we'll start with the first case scenario. So one, uh, you received a call uh, from an adult male uh, who has a foreign accent and sounds very agitated. Uh, from the data, you can tell that this is a recent traveler. So sometimes you may get a call from someone who's traveled recently. I think just this morning, we probably received about three calls from people who know someone who has traveled recently. So basically the questions here, are how do you even have a conversation with someone like this? I'm sure you have neighbors or friends who may be calling you. So one, I really want a history. COVID hasn't taken away our clinical skills. We should still take an appropriate history and be able to, uh, be able to do some triage. So the first thing is you really want to know, has this person traveled recently? When did they arrive? You may get someone who came in January and they're still worried. So that's not someone we should be concerned about. Have they come in the last two to three weeks? That's someone you, you're going to be concerned about. Yeah. Uh, then the next thing is you want to really find out what symptoms do they have? Is it that they are asymptomatic and they're concerned? 
Have they been in quarantine and now they have developed symptoms? Or really, what, what is it that's the reason for them calling you or asking you these questions? Here, if someone has recently traveled and they have symptoms to suggest some respiratory tract infection, or more recently, we're learning that people may have GI symptoms, for example, then that's someone you want to be concerned about and you want to advise them to call 719. I know many of our colleagues have probably told people go to the nearest hospital. We want to avoid as much as possible someone going to the nearest hospital because they may get to a facility where the healthcare workers are unprepared and for that reason, they may end up exposing healthcare workers. They may jump into a matatu or other public transport. So you really want to avoid asking people to jump into public transport. 719 is a call, is a line that's available to people in the community and to doctors as well. So even if you're, um, you encounter a situation that you're not sure how to handle, you can also call 719. And from 719, different people will be called and you know you can have someone go to where this person is to take samples from there so avoid asking people to go out to the nearest facility um so as you assess this patient you find that he is talking complete sentences doesn't have too much shortness of breath he reports that he's had a temperature evaluation recently and well maybe he had some fever but he took some ibuprofen in the night his tummy feels a bit funny so the question of what is the judgment that you need to make at this point? So there are a few things here. So one, the fact that this person has traveled recently and has some symptoms suggesting a fever perhaps means that he fits our case definition. And we'll just look at that in a short while. Um, the concern here, and maybe that's why this has been put here, is that he took some ibuprofen. So there has been some data suggesting that NSAIDs may worsen outcomes. So one, we want to encourage people not to take NSAIDs, probably take paracetamol if you are having fever. The issue of the tummy feeling queasy comes up because now we know that there are some symptoms, GI symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort that may be seen even with COVID. Remember, it's a viral infection that affects mucous membranes and the GI tract is made up of a lot of mucous membranes as well. So this is a patient who we think meets the case. And now they are symptomatic. So just looking at the current case definition. So one, uh, what we suspect or a suspect case is a patient with any acute respiratory illness. They may have fever, cough, shortness of breath. Rarely, some people may present with sore throat or a running nose. Then there is history of travel to a foreign country during the 14 days prior to symptom. They've been in contact with someone with confirmed or a probable case of COVID-19. So now more and more we are getting calls about someone who says, you know, my sister traveled and we've been staying in the same house. In that case, the question is, could the sister have been exposed? So they may have contact with someone who may be a probable case. Uh, in the most recent update of the guidelines, there was the acknowledgement that some people may just present with very severe respiratory illness without having very clear contact. And during this phase, when we're still learning a lot about the disease, we may want to collect samples from people who have very severe respiratory illness and we don't have an alternative diagnosis. So if someone has a lower pneumonia and we think it's bacterial, that one wouldn't fit the case definition. But there's some people who had very severe illness, no one has really found a, an alternative explanation for this illness, that would be a suspect case. A probable case is where you have a suspect but for whatever reason, a test has not been done or a test is inconclusive. And sometimes the lab sends something and says this result is inconclusive. And a confirmed case is where now we have lab confirmation of COVID-19, like the 42 cases that were announced yesterday. Um, so again, what is the meaning of contact? I'm sure many of us in healthcare facilities initially thought if you just approach KNH, even from the parking, and there was a patient with COVID-19, then you become a contact. But what we know is that you require close contact. And the definition of a contact is one, a contact is a person who's experienced the symptoms we've talked about during the two days before or 14 days after onset of symptoms. So if you're working close together in, you know, working in close proximity, you've been sitting in a small room, having meetings the whole day, then someone in that room is confirmed to have COVID-19, then you become a close contact. Or if you've been close to one another, so less than one meter, 
and you've been talking to someone who's confirmed to have COVID for more than 15 minutes, I think some of these periods that are a little arbitrary, they may change as we begin to learn more about the virus. Or if you've been traveling together, so you're sitting on a, a plane next to someone who's later found to have COVID-19, you may remember our case two in the country was someone who was sitting on the plane next to our very first patient. Uh, or if you're living in the same household with someone who has COVID-19. And of course, there are the questions about healthcare exposure. So if you've been working in the infectious disease unit here at KNH or at Mbagathi, and then somebody develops symptoms, and you're working so then if two days the set of symptoms, and up to 14 days after the date, um, on which a sample was collected that confirmed the COVID-19. So those are the terms we'd use to think, is someone a close contact or not? Um, we've already mentioned this, so I'll not belabor it again. So let's think of another case scenario. So this is from a healthcare worker. And uh, these are actually scenarios that we have from the hospital. So um, a healthcare worker tells you that they have a child who is 11 months old, and has fever and COVID. Because now everybody's concerned about fever. Any fever, people are thinking is COVID until otherwise confirmed. So the question is, what is the right thing to do in this situation? We've seen facilities where people ran away or you know, delayed in taking care of a patient. So I guess at the first, um, at the outset to say that we're still we thinking and COVID has not replaced all the other diseases that we have been seeing. So even when we see a patient, for example, has conversion, things like malaria come to mind, meningitis, they could have a pneumonia, you know, they may be having febrile seizures from other things. So it's important that we take further history at this point. So one, is there history of travel, as has been described above? Because those are the things that will help you know how to react to such a situation. I'll give you an example. Recently, we had a child come into the uh, pediatric emergency unit at KNH. The child had fever and had convulsions. And of course, people were concerned, should we, should we be taking care of this child with this fever? Could this be COVID? So travel history is important. And from this one, the mother reports that the child had returned from the UK 10 days ago. The mother does not have any signs. So uh, do we have good reason to be concerned? So the symptoms are there of fever, and now the mother tells you that the history of travel. So what this means to us for clini as clinicians is one, we really have to talk about history of travel and triage everyone who comes. You shouldn't be discovering about history of travel after the patient has been um, examined by 10 people, procedures have been done and someone has been admitted. The initial triage needs to be very clear history of travel, respiratory symptoms, or fever. Those are patients who should be flagged and isolated early so that even other history and workup is done once that isolation has been made. So for such a patient, one, protect yourself as a healthcare worker. It's very important. There's no emergency with a contagious disease. You always have to protect yourself first. So history of travel, and symptoms is a probable case. You want to ensure that if you're in close proximity with this patient, you have the uh, required PPE. And we'll talk about that, some of that PPE as we go along. Then of course, this, patient, this child could die if they had meningitis or other things. So we want to take care of them. So isolate them, have adequate PPE, take care of the emergency issues, and collect a sample for COVID-19 testing. So in terms of triad, and I've just mentioned this, how we should be triaging patients as they come along. So one, it could be self-initiated. For example, the calls that will come uh, that uh, you may receive from people who know you, it could be clinician initiated. So we may be getting calls from other healthcare facilities. So one, we have what is the uh, national call center. We talked about the 719 number. Does this person meet the case definition. So we talked about the case definition. If they don't meet the case definition, you need to reassure them and to refer to either, you know, if it's on phone, you could refer them to the nearest health facility or they could be appropriately taken care of within the health facility if that's where they've shown up. If they do meet a case definition, the national call center is important. So if this is someone who is at home, then there's a rapid response team that will go to the facility and 
uh, or to the facility or to the home and collect a sample. When they collect the sample, they also assess the patient and see whether this is a patient who should be transported to the nearest isolation facility or it's a patient who could stay home until they have a reasonable result. Okay, so that's really what this chart is showing. If they meet case definition with mild symptoms, they would uh, ask them to self-isolate and take a sample. If they have severe symptoms, they would transfer them to the nearest isolation facility, even as they wait for symptoms. And in that case, contact tracing is important. So if we feel that someone meets a case definition, even as they're waiting for results and all the rest, we're still collecting samples, uh, collecting details of who they may have come into contact with for the purposes of follow-up. So we'll go through one more case, then Dr. Maritim uh, will take us through the other cases. So um, this one is a healthcare worker, and it could be any of us actually, or anyone else could be calling you. So a healthcare worker is calling, and you know they are very agitated that they're working in a facility. Uh, I'm not sure where Olengurwone is, but they are from some facility that has not received any PPE. So what, what are the thoughts around this? It'll be interesting even at the end to just hear some of your thoughts around this. If you don't have PPE at your facility, what uh, what you to do to do about it? Let's assess our available the place where we can do a triage, appropriate triage, so that we reduce the number of people who could potentially have COVID walking into the hospital. Okay, that is very, very key. And each health facility or clinic or whatever other place you work in should have that. So if they're at this point, if someone is from Olenguruene, the questions are, what is the risk of having exposure at next day with our own epidemiology? I think everyone can try and mute their microphone so that we don't have a lot of background noise. So one is this healthcare worker, what are they faced with? Is it a patient with fever who has potential for either contact or travel? Because if that is the case, then ideally they should have PPE before approaching that patient. If you're not in close contact with a patient, so you are able to sit two meters apart, for example, then an ordinary surgical mask would suffice. And we'll show a table of what PPE is required for different uh, contexts. If you're in a place where already you know you are receiving patients who have COVID, then having that triage is very important so that the first people who come into contact with any patient already have PPE. They have a mask, um, they're able to wash their hands, clean their hands, and they're already aware that they shouldn't come into close contact with a patient. Okay, the other question is, if you're working in a facility and you already have symptoms, what are the things that you should do? Um, so, um, should I go through this one? Yeah. Okay, let's just go through the PPE one, then we'll go through another, another slide that shows what you should do as a healthcare worker. So healthcare workers who manage patients clinically and have close contact with known or suspected, and suspected goes back to the case definition that we had. This is a patient, or this is a healthcare worker who should have the full PPE. So for example, here in KNH, someone who's working either in the ID unit or in um, Bagathi, the ID unit and Bagathi, if you are in close contact with the patient, they must have the full PPE. Uh, so gloves, a gown, the N95 mask, the goggles. If you're a non-healthcare worker who has close contact, so either security personnel or uh, other cleaning staff, for example, then it's good to have a surgical mask, to have a gown, especially where there is risk of splashing material, for example, someone cleaning, and to have gloves, to change this frequently between patients and maintain hand hygiene. Uh, for staff who have close contact uh, with people of unknown COVID status, so their surgical mask is useful. Uh, if a healthcare worker has symptoms, ideally they should stay home. And if they're working, then they should have a, a surgical mask to reduce the number of droplets to the environment. The same thing with any patient who comes to your facility and has respiratory symptoms. Ideally, that patient should have a mask so that they reduce the uh, number of 
uh, droplets that would potentially contaminate the environment. So, good afternoon, everybody. I have, a mask. I have a mask because I'm seated very close to Lois, <laughs> and uh, we are trying to social distance. So, I'm wearing this mask to create that social distance. So, I'll take us through another scenario, scenario four, which uh, is a call. So, you have received this call. A caller is referred to you from the hotline 719. And this caller is a student who just returned from, from Malaysia in this past week. And she came back um, yesterday evening and has been sent to the hotel for quarantine. Remember, in the recent directives by the head of uh, the president, all people who are coming in had to go to designated facilities for quarantine. So this student is one of them. So she's a Kenyan student who has been studying in Malaysia, but had to go uh, into quarantine. So the student has not experienced any of the three symptoms that we are all aware. She's not had any fever, no cough, no difficulty in breathing. So she's not had any symptoms of COVID, but she's concerned because the bus that took her to the hotel had another traveler who was later taken that night away in an ambulance. So she's very concerned that uh, that traveler might have had COVID and therefore she's calling because of that. So yeah. what is your assessment of this scenario? What steps will you follow? And what advice do you want to give um, this student? So again, this is really just to help us refocus on what uh, Dr. Lois has talked about. That despite the fact that this student may have had contact because of that uh, exposure in the bus, again, you're looking at in terms of your assessment, is that contact close enough and would she really be at risk of uh, getting um, infected with COVID-19 at this point uh, in time. And the fact that she's calling now already suggests that she's already having psychosocial uh, disturbance because of that potential uh, exposure. And she rightfully says that she's not been exposed. So given what we already know about COVID-19, even if she is exposed now, the incubation period is um, from two days to 14 days. So even as she goes into quarantine, the issues that she's calling around uh, now are more psychosocial, and we need to explain to her that probably she may be exposed, but we don't think that that exposure would result in symptoms immediately. And therefore, you, your main aim of this conversation really would be to allay her anxiety and to give, us, to give her advice in terms of how to protect herself. There's also a national number a hotline number that people who need uh, additional psychosocial help can actually call that number. And that number is double one double nine, which is one one nine nine. And it's a number, I hope all of you are writing it down. It's uh, through Red Cross, one one nine nine for psychosocial uh, support for people who um, uh, need support uh, based on maybe exposure to COVID or uh, feeling that they need additional uh, counseling maybe after an exposure. So you've been on the call with this student for the past three minutes. And she insists that you arrange for her to be tested since she wants to leave the facility and go home. And she's afraid that the longer she stays in the hotel facility, the more the chance of being infected. She claims that nobody is using any face masks um, at the hotel facility. So the questions that you're thinking about are what are the steps that you will follow? And what advice will you give uh, this particular uh, student? So remember, she's talking about an exposure in the bus in transit to the hotel facility, and she wants to be tested uh, now. So when we look at, at the incubation period, which is two to 14 days with an average of about five to six uh, days. And when you talk of incubation period, it's from that point of exposure to onset of uh, the first symptoms. So what we know, if you test somebody too early, you can tell them they are negative but then it doesn't necessarily rule out the disease because you've tested them too early. And for most of the studies and the current evidence that exists, there's evidence for screening people who are already symptomatic because then the pre-test probability of the test coming back positive is higher for people who are symptomatic. Current evidence really does not support screening of asymptomatic uh, people. And when you look at this uh, student in particular, her exposure was a few days ago. So therefore, even when you give a, a test result that may be negative, it doesn't really exclude that she may not go on and develop uh, the symptoms. So again, the additional risk you have needed to evaluate is really how close was she 
for example, live in the bus, was she seated immediately close to the person who was tested positive? And remember, the person who's been taken away by the ambulance at night, we don't even know whether they had symptoms of COVID. Remember, when people go to the hotel quarantine facilities, they may have other diseases that really, they may have other comorbidities or might develop other diseases. So being taken away by ambulance does not necessarily mean that that person was taken away because of the COVID-related symptoms. So in terms of risk assessment and even counseling this particular student, those are the considerations. And then just part of educating her to understand the, the clinical cause of the illness that immediately after exposure, not everyone will develop symptoms, but your risk of developing the symptoms or the disease is related to close proximity. So that if she was standing close to this person, less than one meter, then uh, with a droplet infection, then she might have already been in close contact, but then again, duration of that close contact and exposure and the onset of her symptoms may take a few days to uh, occur. This concern about being exposed by being in the um, quarantine facility and being infected uh, because of that exposure and that no one is wearing face masks uh, in that facility. Um, the evidence is coming in at the moment and the protectiveness of face masks, maybe in the coming days we'll have more evidence to suggest that even in public places, people uh, should wear masks. We have a lot of evidence coming in from the Chinese uh, community. And uh, when you read other uh, bodies of evidence like the CDC guidelines, WHO guidelines, they actually recommend face masks for specific categories of people. And these are people who are already symptomatic so that when a patient presents to the facility, symptoms, then they should be offered face masks. Again, they recommend face masks for healthcare workers who are working in close proximity, like in um, many uh, departments within the hospital or people who are likely to come into contact with people who may have symptoms. So at the moment, we haven't uh, had recommendations for use of uh, wide use of face masks in uh, the public setting. So part of management of this student is really to allay anxiety and really to encourage her. Part of um, self-quarantine is really to stay isolated and minimize risk of exposure by keeping to her room within the facility. So making sure that most of the time she's staying in her room and doesn't come into contact with people. So being in quarantine is not a free ticket for people now to, to uh, go against all the distance, social distancing measures that have already been instituted and uh, directed even towards. Basically, it means when you're in that facility, the only additional thing is you'll have uh, daily monitoring by a healthcare provider for development of symptoms, but the social distancing measure still uh, um, apply. So for this particular student, it would still uh, be part of the counseling to advise her that she, she is not really at risk of COVID so long as she stays in her room and keeps away from the rest of the people and she doesn't need any face mask at this point. But if she has uh, any additional need for psychosocial support, then this is uh, a person we'd ask to call the 1199 number. Let's move on now to scenario number five. And this is uh, the, 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 the scenario. You receive a call from a nurse working at a hospital triage desk, and she's concerned because the patient she has triaged has been confirmed to have COVID. She wants to be tested. So the question is, what assessment will you make and what advice will you give? And this is actually the commonest call we get from healthcare workers. And we are hoping that through this um, educational session, maybe we'll uh, have less and less of these calls. But really, it's for us to reflect and see what should we do when we uh, have potentially been exposed to somebody who tests uh, positive for COVID, because it can be very, very uh, uh, distressing. So when you look at the evidence we currently have, and we've seen this in China, we've seen this, this in Italy as well as in Spain, a lot of healthcare workers have had uh, infection because of uh, looking after uh, patients, and particularly for patients who eventually uh, test positive. And that's why in Dr. Cheng's presentation, we emphasize, and this is a message that will even go to the public, when people have symptoms of COVID, they do not self-present to the nearest health facility, but they call 719, the number 719, and based on that, they'll be advised on what or which facilities 
uh, they can be linked to through the rapid response team. So there's already a system that is being put in place to be able to link uh, symptomatic patients or patients who are self-presenting to facilities and ensure safe transportation through designated ambulances and transportation to uh, designated facilities. So specifically for surveillance of healthcare workers, in communities where transmission is occurring, healthcare personnel should be monitored uh, for symptoms of febrile respiratory illness. And this is done, uh, for example, in the isolation unit uh, in Bagasi. The healthcare workers take a temperature in the morning and take a temperature again in the evening. So very strict uh, monitoring and any additional symptoms beyond even the temperature. Healthcare personnel who develop the symptoms are instructed not to report to uh, to, to patient uh, care activities and to, they notify their supervisors and the infection control personnel. In communities without SARS-CoV-2 transmission, healthcare personnel working in the areas where their patients are being assessed or isolated are also monitored for development of uh, febrile respiratory infection. And healthcare personnel who develop, again, are instructed not to report uh, to patient-related uh, activities. They should cease patient activities and notify their supervisor and infection control and they are evaluated, there's uh, evaluation including uh, testing for uh, COVID-19. So healthcare personnel who do not have a febrile respiratory illness may continue uh, to work. However, asymptomatic healthcare personnel who have had unprotected exposure to COVID-19, again, are recommended to quarantine. And uh, so they stop all patient activities, they start the self-quarantine, and in the quarantine, they are monitoring for symptoms. And um, and they actually get uh, tested. Here in the slide, it shows quarantine for seven days. It should actually be 14 uh, days, but we, for healthcare workers, there's an expedited uh, testing protocol where they'll be tested uh, earlier. And if they test negative, then they can uh, resume. They can, after the 14 days, they can go back to work. If they test positive, then they have to uh, start isolation and monitoring and basically uh, management, because now testing positive would be uh, development of COVID disease. But again, in terms of uh, whether progression, basically monitoring for progression to see if uh, it will be mild, moderate, or severe disease. So that is a different setting. But in this, what we're covering is in terms of the, what should the healthcare worker immediately do? And the immediate thing to do is the quarantine and then testing uh, after a number of days. So sick healthcare personnel, this uh, Dr. Cheng actually mentioned in her presentation, healthcare personnel who are sick should not report to work if they have a respiratory illness. And the importance of this is that you don't want to transmit the respiratory illness to the patients that you are nursing. In communities where transmission is occurring, healthcare personnel who develop a febrile respiratory illness should be excluded from work and should be tested for COVID-19. If negative, they stay away from work until the symptoms resolve. If positive, then they proceed for self-isolation um, for a period of 14 days. But again, uh, at the time, they, because this is COVID disease, they would have to have two negative tests 24 hours apart to actually say that they have cleared the infection. What we currently know about COVID-19, some people take long to clear the virus and some people may clear the virus after resolution of symptoms. So in the current case management guidelines that will be circulated if you haven't already received, is that for you to, for us to say that you've cleared the infection, you have to be symptom free and uh, have had a test with two tests negative with a, with a period of 24 hours between the two tests. So that way the risk of infecting others, because some people may be asymptomatic but still have the virus and be shedding the virus. Healthcare personnel who develop febrile respiratory illness and have been working in areas of the hospital where SARS-CoV-2 patients have been hospitalized should be excluded from work for seven days or until symptoms resolve, whichever is longer. I think this is the last slide. So we'll open up for a Q and A session. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Okay. Kalanti, moderate the Q&A. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Loise Cheng and uh, Dr. Mari Timberg. 
we truly appreciate the presentation. Now we can go to the QA. Kindly put your questions on the chat box or alternatively, you can raise your hand and we'll be able to unmute you so that you can share your thoughts or ask your question. So let me go to the questions that are already there on the chat box. I'm seeing uh, some feedback from, all right, there's somebody asking for guidelines. Uh, Kagema requesting for guidelines. Then there's a concern from somebody uh, listed as iPhone. How concerned are we about transmission by asymptomatic infected persons? Um, okay, so um, highest risk of transmission is in someone who is symptomatic because they'd potentially be releasing more droplets that carrying the infectious material. Having said that, we know that um, uh, transmission can occur even without symptoms. And that's why you see in the case definition, contact is expanded to starting two days prior to and up to 14 days after, um, after uh, onset of symptoms. So it can occur, though we know that highest or peak of transmissibility is with symptoms. Thank you. For those who, for those who are asking for the guidelines, they're available in our website, KNH website. You'll be able to find the guidelines there. There's a question from Dennis Oborn. Dennis is asking, how relevant is no history of travel in Kenya now that we have tens of local confirmed cases? Um, so I'm not sure we have tens. Most of the confirmed cases have been in travelers. We've had a few confirmations from those who haven't traveled. But of these confirmations, they had very close contact with people who had traveled and were confirmed to have our cases. So for example, if we look at our case number three in the country, it actually lived in the same household as a very fast confirmed case. We've had somewhere someone was working in maybe a hotel, for example, and had had very close contact with many travelers living there. So at this point for all the confirmed cases, there was some link with someone who'd traveled. Having said that, this is an important question because when you begin to have a lot of community transmission, so for example, if you're not able to uh, get all the contacts and some of them develop disease and no one knows about them, well, the minute we have a lot of community transmission, then having a definite case definition becomes difficult, in which case we move to anyone who has fever or respiratory symptoms should ideally get a test. And of course, as we know, the more we test, the more we win the battle of control. Because it means as you test more people, you may find others who had not been identified earlier. And you're able to take these ones into either isolation or quarantine, into isolation to protect other people. Yeah. So it becomes an important question the more cases we see. Uh, thank you. So we have Lois, Lois Kuze. Lois, let me unmute you. I see your hand is raised. Let me unmute you so that you can ask your questions before we proceed to the other questions. Hello. This is Lois. Mm -hmm. uh, we, during screening, there's a concern. Uh, patients are lying about contact with positive uh, cases or likely contact with people who are sick. So there's that problem. So seeing as Kenya is already a country that has COVID, can we put Kenya in the, can we remove that, exclude Kenya from travel history? Because if you're already in Kenya, especially Mombasa, you're already in contact with someone, maybe when crossing the ferry, maybe in the matatu, in the supermarket, you never know. So can we take patients who present with the typical presentations as a positive case until proven negative? I think at the moment, we, we don't have that evidence that the disease is transmitting very widely in Mombasa. I think we are following the data that is being provided by the Disease Surveillance Unit to really help us to see how much transmission is happening. And we haven't gotten that. So when you look at the disease, when you have uh, COVID in a new population, most people, most uh, new cases would present with their upper respiratory tract findings. And that's what we think in Kenya is still a fairly new disease. And then in the second week, basically it ha it's a disease that has like a, a, a very clear natural cause. In the first part of the illness, you have largely upper respiratory tract signs. And then in the second phase of the illness, 
the disease moves from being an upper respiratory tract disease and then becomes a lower respiratory tract disease. And that's when people present with pneumonia and its various forms, maybe severe pneumonia, critical illness, shock, and the various aspects of the disease. So for us to okay. really modify the case definition, and we know that in this country, there are so many other causes of upper respiratory tract infection. We even had upper respiratory tract infection before COVID came. So I think the data that will really help us is we, we sample a large population and we see that a lot of people may be coming up with upper respiratory tract in, um, signs in Mombasa is, are found to be COVID positive. Then we can say then it needs the case definition to be uh, changed. When you look at the new case definition that was circulated from uh, late last week, like Thursday and Friday, the new case definition encompasses a spectrum of people who will present to healthcare facilities with an explained severe pneumonia, and those ones are taken care of. So for the question about um, contact in Mombasa, it's a bit difficult at this stage in time to say that anybody now who presents with an upper respiratory tract uh, futures would be necessarily be said to have COVID. But what we need to do maybe is to expand the testing and see and maybe even to, to see, because in that particular setting, the other aspects that would reduce even uh, contact and exposure would be the social distances. And we've seen from, the, from uh, what happens at the ferry boarding, those are not really being adhered to. So while we agree that the disease may evolve to be that way in the coming week, in this particular week, it's a bit difficult to say that. And then remember again, in Mombasa, there could be other causes of fever, things like even malaria and other conditions that would still explain the fever. So it's a bit difficult to generalize. We need more evidence from uh, screening to really say that all people who are coming, they don't really need to have the travel history because so far, most of the cases that we've identified are related to people who've had contact with somebody who had traveled. And when you look at even the, the close contact, people who had traveled and came back maybe uh, in the last uh, 14 days or so, their contacts are taken care of because when you're looking at that contact with a person who had traveled, we are expanding it even to the previous uh, 30 days. So looking back at potential contact, yeah. Uh, we have a comment from John Kagema. John Kagema says, Dr. Maritim and Dr. Cheng, I'm worried about the issues on quarantine. At the moment, I'm on quarantine and I feel the staff in charge of the facilities have no idea. Please, there is need for information to down to be downgraded to other healthcare workers. So thank you for that comment, Joan. I hope you're doing well. There's also another comment from Joan again. Most of these facilities have PPEs, a special request to follow up. I'm not so sure what you're trying to say there, Joan, but from Dorothy Awak. Dorothy uh, has a comment as a question, how can one differentiate the GI symptoms from other GI infections such as amoeba, typhoid, ETC? Wow. <laughs> uh, th uh, thanks for that question, Dorothy. I think at this point, it's, it's very difficult because as we know many viral syndromes uh, mimic each other. So for example, if you take uh, URTI symptoms from influenza, for example, which represent with cough, fever, difficulty breathing. Um, again, as we said, this, it affects mucosal membranes. So a lot of what we'd see in the GI, you know, the discomfort, maybe diarrhea, would be very similar to what you'd see with other viral syndromes. So at this point, we don't have any clear data or any criteria that you'd use to differentiate one from another. Having that high index of suspicion, doing proper trials to include travel and contact is what remains important. Thank you. We have a question from Peter Mtanda. Hi, Peter. Peter is saying, with community infections confirmed, is history of travel a determinant in indexing the suspected cases? I think that had been answered, but maybe we can repeat it in case Peter was not online. Um, so I guess uh, at this point, we haven't, from the testing that has been done, we haven't demonstrated a lot of community transmission. The cases that have been identified at the moment, most are in returning travelers, and we have a few in people who haven't traveled but have had con close contact with the returning travelers. So either in the same household or sitting next to each other on the plane, or you know, have worked with or have been hanging out with returning travelers. But as we said earlier, 
if we demonstrate more community cases, as we get a lot of cases, then the issue of travel becomes less of a, um, of a differentiating factor, so to speak. So at this point, when we still don't have too many cases and you're able to tell where they came from, then that history of travel still remains important. But as the outbreak evolves and we have more and more community cases, then that case definition will change. John, I can see your hand. I'll address you right now. But first, let's answer Elizabeth's question. Elizabeth Bimba from Dental School is asking on testing positive, is the health worker, is the healthcare worker to self-isolate or to report to a quarantine center? So I'll take Dr. Dimba's question. So currently for the healthcare workers, we haven't had yet uh, any healthcare worker who has tested positive. But for healthcare workers who turn positive, we they would actually be managed in the isolation facilities. And the main reason for this is that we would like at this point to have test positive in the facility because that helps even uh, containment of the disease. So currently all positive cases are managed in designated isolation facilities, which we, you may be aware of some uh, nationally, and even the counties are, uh, have set up uh, isolation facilities. So I think the healthcare workers are to be managed in facilities. And the main reason for that is that it's very difficult for somebody who's uh, positive to even have the peace of mind that they may not infect their loved ones. So to take away that mental anguish for the healthcare workers, they'll be nursed in the dedicated isolation facility. There's a team uh, under the Ministry of Health that is actually developing guidelines re uh, related to healthcare workers in terms of the infection, where they'll be based, like when they're working in the quarantine facilities and all that. So uh, those guidelines will probably be out uh, very soon. But for now, the guidance is for any healthcare workers who test positive, they'll be taken to the designated isolation facilities and manage uh, there. All right, let me unmute Joan. Hello. Hello, Joan. Hello, good afternoon. Hey, how are you? Fine, thank you. My question is this, can you hear me? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Um, mine is, despite that I'm in quarantine, my issue is that uh, when we came, there was a lot of confusion and there was also a lot of, there was no, what you call, social distance. And then by the time that we were, the people that were arriving were put in areas that were so crowded and the issues of the PPs were not there, issue of especially soap and uh, sanitizers or, or even water, what I say it's water. So my worry is, and then when, uh, because I think the people that are supposed to man this, but there are some of the, the county health workers. I was asking, yes, uh, why were they, uh, they were not ready for that? So my, my worry is, could they have we contacted about that or, or any other issue? Hello? Sorry, please repeat. What is the question? The question is about the way I had repeated earlier on about the proper information and yeah. also the information to the people who are being quarantined. Because if you don't educate the people that are in quarantine as a team, as the people that are being quarantined, they are not even aware of what is happening. They need to be informed. We need a lot of communication so that we can be able to understand. Okay. Uh, and like, like me, that I'm able to connect to you guys. Mm. But for the others, we are not having information. And even the ones that are supposed to man the centers have mm. very little or no information. Okay, I think we get you, John. And your concern is yeah. very valid. Uh, at the time mm -hmm. when the mandatory quarantine was set in, I think there were still a lot yeah. of systems to be put in place to make sure it mm. all went smoothly. I think there was also not mm -hmm. a clear appreciation of how many mm -hmm. people would actually come mm -hmm. in during that last two days. It was, I think, a bit mm -hmm. overwhelming even for the system. Uh, but having mm -hmm. said that, I think now there are more, there's a team that's actually been charged with taking care of uh, the quarantine facilities and uh, it's getting better as time goes on. I know we've had a lot of concerns from people say, what if I've been exposed in a quarantine facility, for example? And I think there'd be more information going to those in quarantine. There are also teams that have been set up that are helping to manage in terms of educate, you know, there's uh, now doctors and nurses who have been charged to these facilities. So I think it's going to get easier 
and better over the next few days. And just to let you know, some of what will be done is that everyone in quarantine will get a test probably at about day seven or thereabout since they came in. And if anyone is positive, they will be moved to, a, to an isolation facility. Those who are negative will still be asked to continue quarantine to at least 14 days. So I think that's improving. Uh, yes, uh, the initial phase was a little uh, disorganized. I think one, the number of people who came in once that announcement was made that all flights would be stopped by last week Wednesday was very, very big and it overwhelmed the systems that had been put in. But we take note of your comments and we shall relay that information to the other teams that are working on that. And since you're in there and you know, educate those you are with. Okay, so someone is asking about uh, clearly defined mild versus moderate versus severe. So we have in the national guidelines, there's a description of uh, what would uh, come as mild. So mild, uh, you know, they don't really have a pneumonia. They may have some upper respiratory symptoms, oxygen saturation is normal, they do not have any difficulty in breathing, no dyspnea, no, tachycard no tachypnea. So those are patients who are generally very, very stable. So when they go to moderate, then they, they have a bit more dyspnea, uh, oxygen saturations may go down to about 94%. And those who are severe now have, you know, usually at this point, there's a lot of infiltrates in the lung. Some may be going into ARDS. Uh, they're unable to maintain uh, oxygenation on room air and may have to add oxygen and may require ventilation if they're in significant um, respiratory failure. Uh, thank you. From Bill Kigathi, when do we make the threshold to presume local transmission? Um, I think th this one is not a very easy question. It really depends on the test results that we're seeing. Just based on pure modeling, we're unable to tell at least on the results that we have so far from the 42 patients we've been confirmed to have. So I think over the next few days, as more testing is rolled out, if you remember what the cabinet secretary was saying yesterday, that now there are more test kits. So more testing is going to be rolled out priority being those in quarantine and those who are being traced as contacts. If you find that a number of contacts have uh, infection, then we presume that there is community transmission. In terms of those in quarantine, if they have, then again, we won't assume community transmission because they are held in controlled environments until such a time that we expect they're not transmitting anymore. So it is really dependent on what results we're seeing as to more testing is being rolled out. All right, from Judy, Judy is asking, is there a cutoff for the temperature reading or as long as there is fever with respiratory symptoms, then one is a suspect for COVID-19? So in the, in the guidelines and in the case definition, we've emphasized a temperature of 38 degrees with uh, presence of the uh, symptoms. So currently that's uh, the threshold. But uh, from studies, some patients even can have like a lower uh, temperature reading uh, than that. But for this um, case definition, this is like to get a majority of people who are likely to have, then that's really uh, the, the, the temperature threshold of 38 degrees. I think part of, part of the reason why in the guideline they say it's uh, either you have fever or respiratory symptoms, you don't have to have all, all the them. symptoms for us to think it's a case, is that um, in other studies have shown that even up to uh, only 60% of those with the disease may actually have a fever. So there are people who will have COVID but never develop a fever. So it's you have fever or cough or difficulty breathing plus now the epidemiologic criteria as well. Thank you. I'm seeing two raised hands, but let me ignore them briefly. So from George, George is asking, in case of a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and history of travel, are encountered and put in isolation ward, then later confirmed as COPD. Does the patient continue with the isolation? Um, so if you, if let's say they've been put there as a suspect, I guess uh, that's what he's asking, that you are suspected to have COVID, but uh, so you were put, for example, the poor end up in Bagathi because they think they may have respiratory symptoms, but the test comes back negative. I'm going to change that question because maybe that's what will be most relevant. Sorry, sorry, George, you can clarify if it's not what you're looking for. If the test comes back as negative, 
So the way we are doing it, for example, in Bagati, is that those who are suspected to have disease are put on one wing of the ward, and those who are confirmed are put on another wing. So it's important that you don't mix people who have confirmed disease with those who are suspect, so that you reduce that contact. So if someone does not have disease, then they can come out of isolation. If it is felt that during isolation, for whatever reason, they may have had contact, then they should go into quarantine, not into isolation. So Teresa, let me answer you very quickly. Are the cleaners and support, I believe it's support staff, going to get trained on infection control and disposal? Yes, Teresa, they got trained. We had trainings for two weeks, starting from the other week. They just ended on Friday. But in case you have any particular department or area that you'd like to be trained, kindly reach out to Infection Prevention Control Unit. They'll be able to train you. If it's on disinfection and decontamination, Public Health Department is doing the training, so kindly reach out to them. Thank you. So, Anthony, let me unmute you. Hello. Can you hear Hello? me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I wanted to ask you about uh, testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. You realize that uh, during testing, we take our samples from a uh, uh, nasopharyngeal area mm -hmm. or oropharyngeal area. Mm -hmm. And now if uh, the disease has uh, already gone down to low respiratory tract, is the mode of testing still uh, valid? Uh, thank, thank you for that question. So. Uh, yes, it is still valid. When we look at the samples that yield the highest uh, result from a test, uh, a sample from the lower respiratory tract, like a bronchalveolar lavage, for example, will probably yield the highest. But having said that, viral shedding happens in the respiratory tract, both upper and lower respiratory tract. So yes, even when someone has a pneumonia, they'll sh still shed virus from the upper respiratory tract. And the most easily available sample to us is still a nasopharyngeal, a properly taken nasopharyngeal swab. Okay, before I go to George, let me answer Akini. Akini is saying this is for the public. Can those outline numbers be circulated to the public to minimize confusion? Yes, Akini, that has really happened. And you're able to get the hotline numbers. So George is asking, what are some of the differential diagnoses comparable to COVID-19? I don't know what he usually tried. So uh, when we talk about the differential diagnosis, it's other conditions that can present like COVID-19. And uh, there are very many differential diagnoses. And really, when you look at the evolution of even COVID-19, that's how the Chinese were able to find that there's a new disease that's causing, there's a new virus that's causing the infection that was not the usual thing. So when you look at the differential diagnosis, again, it can vary in the early part of the illness versus in the late part of the illness. So I'll focus on the late part of the illness. So you have different viral etiologies that can cause disease that is very... Uh, clinically similar to COVID-19. And we have a long list, the influenza viruses, respiratory syncytial viruses, parainfluenza viruses, adenovirus, human metanumo virus. Some of these are a bit rare and maybe cause disease in uh, the younger children, some in patients with uh, comorbidities, respiratory comorbidities. But again, other um, infections may be bacterial infections like streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus influenza, among others. So when you look at the disease and how the Chinese were able to identify, so um, after the outbreak of uh, SARS in 2002, 2003, MERS in uh, 2013, there is currently a worldwide uh, surveillance system for patients presenting with severe acute respiratory illness. And particularly in China, they were watching out. And in that hospital, they actually found patients who are presenting with severe acute respiratory illness were showing up in the facility. And in that hospital, they're able to do a panel of seven uh, etiological uh, causes for pneumonia, to look for seven causes of pneumonia. And when they looked for the seven causes, they could not find any of them. So they were concerned that what is it exactly that's causing uh, the disease in those particular patients. And that's when now they started looking and they found the SARS-CoV-2, severe acute, acute respiratory 
uh, syndrome uh, coronavirus type 2. So that's how they were able to find out. So particularly in our setting, when you're thinking about differential diagnosis, maybe in our setting, we're not able to look for the other causes of influenza. But the most important thing is that for patients who meet the case definition and when we do the test, maybe we find COVID-19, then we clearly say that COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV, the virus is actually the one that's causing the uh, disease. In other settings, they're able to look for the other things and say that you don't have COVID-19, but maybe you have influenza A or B or a different type of uh, viral etiology. In our setting, we don't really have resources to do uh, that specific, to explain what else could be causing that. But for the purpose of diagnosing COVID-19, I think we should be content that when we find the disease and it's there and it explains the symptoms, then we say it's the one that's really causing the disease. Okay. Uh, we are two minutes past our end time. No, Kindly indulge me for 10 more minutes. And uh, the ones who've raised your hands, please make it very brief, very short, to the point. So Dr. Lydia Octoy, I'm unmuting you. Kindly make it brief. Dr. Octoy. Okay, Dr. Octoy is not online. So there's a concern from Celestine. Celestine says, my neighbor jetted in 10 days ago and is self-quarantining in his house. How safe are we? <laughs> okay, so um, thanks, Celestine. So uh, one is, if they've stayed in their house, uh, then you're safe. If their children... You know, even self-quarantine, the ideal way of doing it is that if you're in a house, you have your own room, you stay in that room, your food is given to you in that room, you don't mingle with the rest of your family. Because the minute you mingle with the family, then it means now that's a whole household quarantine, not a one-person quarantine. So it's good to know what's been going on there. If they've been mingling with the entire household and the children are playing with their children, then that's reason to be concerned. But if they've not left their house, then you're safe. It can't climb walls and go through. So don't worry. If they've stayed in their house, then you're safe. If you have concern that they're not, uh, they're moving around too much, then I think there's a, a line that was given. You can even call 719 and say, you know what? I know someone who traveled and they're not coming. Or call 988. I know someone who traveled and they're not staying in quarantine then what happens is in that case, that person, a team will be sent to their house to get a sample for testing. So that if they've been moving around and they're positive, uh, an idea of contact tracing will also happen. Okay. There's uh, one comment I'm seeing here about dental officers not having, mm -hmm. having been trained. I think that's mm -hmm. an important observation and we'll try and follow up on that one. The train is to man the call centers. Yes. All right, so techno, technical, let me unmute you. Make it brief, please. Hello. 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 Hello, Hello. we can hear you. Yeah, good afternoon, I'm Michel. I am I'm from the psychological world. I want to know how much of psychological care are we doing to these people? One, when you send somebody to quarantine, he's all alone, he's not talking to anyone. But even those who are in isolation, they're just in isolation, they're all alone. How much are we doing when it comes to psychological care for these people? So all right, Sorry. Techn there's, a, there's a meeting on... So the sensitization on mental health debriefing we'll have one again on th on wednesday so mm. kindly let me allow you to push your question to thursday to wednesday sorry is that okay thank you thank you thank you thank you very much and i think also to or, let me have the number of 1199 mm -hmm. uh it's important for people who may need to call in to get a, a telepsychological support Mm. Um, I think one of the things, this is a very difficult situation because when people are in isolation, you're also trying to minimize contact with other people. Uh, we're trying to preserve PPE for those who have to go in. So most psychological support may not necessarily be in person, but you can also encourage them to call this number to get support uh, online at other times. Okay. Githaiga has a comment. Could it be that the reason that the people with COVID have contact or have traveled because those are the only ones you're testing? Um, so, uh, well, 
we never know. <laughs> we, we really can't say that it's absolutely not there. Um, we sort of had tested a few people even before we got the first case. Most of the people we tested are those who had traveled. And it's because of that testing that you ended up finding the very first case. Most of the initial people who came in had other viruses rather than COVID. Uh, the only way to be absolutely certain that you don't have it circulating in the environment is if you are able to mass test everybody in the community, not just once, but repeatedly. That's the only way. But for now, um, based on the data that we have, we believe that uh, those who have it are those who've traveled or have had close contact. But as you see in every society, this is rapidly evolving. So even what we're saying could change in the next few days and we just have to keep updated. Okay, before we get to Dr. Lydia Okutoy again, we have a question from Angoro. Do we have enough testing kits in the country and are the counties prepared since most patients have been referred to Nairobi and Bagati for testing and quarantine, e.g. the Kakamega patients? So um, I think in terms of the testing kits, we have, uh, we cannot say we really have enough because when you look at strategies in some of the countries, they've had a lot of test kits to test everyone. What I can say for now is that we have test kits to test the immediate contacts of those people who've traveled as well as the people who are in quarantine, which we think are the people to really watch because the disease is likely to be found in those uh, groups of people. Some of you also might be uh, reading uh, and listening to TV and we got a donation from uh, Jack Ma and we've included a lot of test kits. So those test kits, I think have reached the country and are being deployed to the necessary uh, uh, location. So I think for now we can say we have enough test kits for the current situation, but we will change uh, the strategy and want to test more people. Because even when you're looking at test kits, you have to bear in mind that you have to test and for the positive people, you have to retest them again, like two additional tests before you can actually say that they are free of disease. Some even may need more tests because you might do your first test and you find they're still positive and have to do additional tests. So for now, the kids that we have, they are not too abundant, but they're enough to help us really know the direction of where this epidemic is going uh, to. Uh, the person has also asked about preparation for the counties. I think when you look at preparation, even for now, we are in the response, but, but we are still doing a lot of preparation and part of even healthcare worker training is part of the preparation. So when you look at preparation plan, we have the healthcare worker training, which is currently being undertaken even to the level of the counties. We have preparation in terms of development of isolation units, which is currently very advanced. And uh, from the Ministry of Health point of view, there was a team that actually went to all the counties and assess the facilities that have been dedicated as isolation facilities. And they'll be pre preparing uh, the report and presenting and to see where are the gaps and what is necessary uh, for the uh, various gaps. And when we look at the disease currently, we know counties already that have disease and to prioritize those counties and even help the other counties build up their capacity because it will not make sense for all the people to be brought as far as maybe CIA or wherever it is to be brought to Nairobi. So to have local facility to attend to patients who are already diagnosed in those specific counties. So already that is work that is very advanced. The other preparation is about testing and lab testing. And we know many facilities have been identified that will be offering uh, testing across the country. A lot of the Camry labs, including Camry in Kilifi, Camry in Kisumu, many Camry labs are already ready to uh, offer the test. So there's a lot of decentralized services that are all linked to a reporting system under the Ministry of Health. So when you talk about preparedness, I think we are, like the country has done fairly well in terms of uh, preparedness, uh, this epidemic to prepare and to uh, respond. So I think really that's what we can talk about, uh, really put in place. And for us as healthcare workers to take that responsibility, I think many of us sometimes we, we are disconnected because when we talk of the government, the government, but you can still do our part as individuals really to contribute to this uh, response. And I think some things that the government has put in place, including physical distancing, each one of us should take it a responsibility among ourselves so that you are one meter away or two meters away from that person who's potentially your close contact. So there are many things that the country, the government is doing, but even us as healthcare workers on the front line, we need to be able to do 
to educate even the public and to sort of like disseminate. I think sometimes in social media, we are too con consumed by the negative messages that is there. So we need to acknowledge the positive messages so that even the people who are working hard on the epidemic don't feel discouraged because when we are just criticizing, criticizing, it doesn't really help. But so far, the government is doing fairly well in terms of preparation and response. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, Dr. Lydia Okotoy, please ask your question. Thank you very much, uh, Mary Beth and uh, Dr. Lewis. Mine is just uh, on issues of PPEs, especially the masks. As you can see, it's been a major discussion on the social forum for the consultants in Kenyatta. So in view of our current stocks and our projected increased numbers, how do we optimize, given that we've been given a direction by MOH and there are some direction from CDC, but now hitting the ground would want a little bit more advice. I know you have touched it in the discussion, but please mention something in that regard. All right. okay. Sorry sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Laisa Cheng. As you answer that one, there's one from Lynette McCory, still on masks, and she's concerned that everyone is wearing all sorts of masks everywhere. What advice can you give as far as wearing of masks is concerned? Okay, yeah. this, this is a question I was hoping would come, <laughs> but I'm glad has come. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on around masks, and I think uh, there's not very clear direction on what we should be doing. If you look internationally, every country sort of has uh, slightly different um, recommendations for mask wearing. For example, recently we were having a video conference with the China CDC team and some of the people who manage the outbreak. And for them, they recommended masks for almost everybody. So on the streets, people were wearing masks. On the other extreme, if you go to the US, they're saying, you know, if you're walking out in public, there's no masks. And if you go to European countries, again, they're differing um, recommendations. So what is the basic idea around wearing masks? Is one, for someone who has symptoms or has infection, you reduce the amount of droplet into, into the environment. So that's why earlier we said, if a healthcare worker or a patient has uh, any URTI symptoms, ideally they should wear a mask. And that's really just to reduce contamination of the environment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for someone who is well with no excess risk and is out in the open, you know, you are walking on the road somewhere, the utility of having a surgical mask is not very clearly understood. But if you are in a closed environment, you know, you are in a hospital setting, you're in a place where there's a lot of crowding, then maybe having that mask may reduce, one, reduce how much you contaminate the environment, because we're all walking around thinking it's the other people who have the disease. Maybe it's us contaminating the environment. So one, it reduces the amount of environmental contamination, and that may reduce how many people then come into contact. Having said that, we must realize that masks on their own are not um, a sure prevention or cure. Uh, we've seen out there people wearing the mask, they remove them, they put them in their pocket, they touch them, they carry them again, they wear them. So if you are touching dirty surfaces and touching your mask, then you've, you've beaten the purpose, the whole purpose of having the mask. So they cannot be taken on their own. It needs to be taken together with all the other hygiene measures, you know, social distancing and frequent hand washing with soap and water. All right. Thank you, Miriam, for your input on the dentists. Dr. Lisa Chen will pick it up. Gloria, are there plans to do screening survey at outpatient facilities on sampled symptomatic patients at select outpatient facilities? This would help pick up community transmission early. Uh, that, that's an important question and a very important strategy for rolling out um, screening. Because mm -hmm. if you are able to identify people who are infected early, then you reduce uh, contact and transmission. At this point, uh, we are hoping for the time when we have very many test kits. At this point, we are going to where we are likely to get the highest, uh, highest return for the few test kits that are deployed. So you, you go to where you know your pretest probability is highest. And our pretest probability right now is highest in those who are in quarantine because of travel and potential exposure out there and contacts. So that's where, if you had to prioritize what you have, that's where we'd go to first. Beyond that, then it would be now community screening. 
and a good entry point would be any outpatient facilities, test everybody who has some URTI symptoms or unexplained fever. So that would be the ne next tier in our, um, in our priority list, for example. And beyond that, it would be anyone who wants a test. So I think for now, for the resources that we have, we're going for the place where we think we'd find the most cases. Yeah, okay. just to add on to that, when you look at uh, different transmission scenarios, we think we are in transmission scenario number three, where you have introduction of disease and then clustering around those uh, imported disease. And that's where we're looking at the contacts, the positive cases that we already have and their close contacts, as well as even the recent travelers, because most of our cases from the 42 cases that we currently have are from uh, recent travelers. So when you talk of community transmission, this is where the disease now has been introduced, is widely circulating in the community, and then you have uh, people who are presenting. So when you look at even approaches, we are still in that scenario number three where we hope to contain the outbreak. We have not yet given up because by the time you have community transmission, then you have to change even your, your approach to the, the outbreak because now you're, it's almost like now you, you've given up and you're just like now trying to uh, treat the cases. And that's where, when you look at New York and Italy and Spain, a lot of Europe, that's where we reach. We feel we are still in scenario number three and we still want to contain the outbreak. So containing the outbreak is all the social distancing um, directives that have been put in place as well as even active contact tracing and screening of those contacts. And we think our highest yield will be from uh, the contacts that are, uh, have been identified, as well as even the recent travelers that are currently uh, serving their quarantine uh, sessions and being followed up uh, actively and being even offered testing. So really to contain and mitigate a widespread outbreak. Thank you. Thank you for that response. There are two questions that I'd like to ask from Gitaiga and Marie at the same time. So Gitaiga is asking, could there be a possibility that the cases of local spread are more than is known because you're only testing those with history of travel or contact? And Marie is asking, what sort of projected numbers of positive cases do we have in the next two weeks, one month, ATC, from modeling studies? Okay, thank you very much. Maybe these are the maybe last two or three questions we'll take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one is, could there be community transmission that we don't know? Um, I, we can't say no, because you see, uh, this knowledge is only based on what testing has been done. So based on the testing that has been done, we know who the cases are, travelers and their close contacts. Of course, the more people come up in the society. So for example, before the mandatory quarantine came up, the guys who traveled and had been asked to self-quarantine, some obeyed that direction some did not. So as we pick more cases, then of course with every case you pick, you must think about how many contacts they have and what's the potential that the contacts have gotten um, exposed and further exposed other people. So I think that's a question that we'll only begin to have the answer to in the next few weeks as more testing is done and as more contacts are traced. I think there's another question that came up of how, uh, how is the, well, they asked us, how are we preparing to achieve the surge capacity? capacity yes. And I think we, we live and work in Kenya. We know what our capacity is. Mm -hmm. um, we know that if we had a huge surge, if we had 100,000 patients, we know, for example, we may not be able to handle that. So I think it's also just being realistic. And if you listen to part of what the CS was talking about yesterday, was beginning to open up other institutions to potentially act as isolation facilities. So that with time you'll say, if we had hundreds of thousands of patients, for example, you'd say that those who have mild disease, if they're able to isolate at home because they have space, then they do that. Or they would go to designated isolation facilities, which may not necessarily be hospitals because they don't really need medical treatment per se then those who have severe disease and need ongoing medical treatment will then go into hospitals. So that, those would be some of the thoughts around how to handle a surge. The aim with the surge is to, one, reduce contact so that you don't have even a bigger surge. So finding a way in which to keep isolating everyone, even if it is not within the hospital. All right, this is the second last comment from Dr. Evelyn Chege. The COVID-19 testing should be expanded to include private facilities and work synergistically, even help the test to come in the expanded in for expanded testing. 
And the second one is apart from COVID-19 testing, we have other tests including full blood count, cardiac markers, procalcitonin. Are the other centers apart from KNH able to carry out the testing? So in terms of uh, expanding tests to private facilities, I think this is one of those situations where government alone cannot manage. And uh, I think every private facility is invited to come on board and support the response. We have seen, for example, that the Khan Hospital is already doing testing. The other day, we received notification that Lancet labs are able to test. And I think other hospitals are also coming on board and saying, can we be validated? I think the issue is to make sure that quality is maintained because you don't want a situation where you end up with false negatives, for example that then are released falsely and continue transmitting into the, into the society. So it's just an issue of if there are facilities that have the capacity, they can actually ask for some validation to be done. And if that's done, they will actually be provided with some of the test kits so that they can help. Because it's a situation where it's upon everybody to respond. Um, yeah, and then related even to the testing, I think the current protocol that is envisaged by the government is where even communication of positive results, there's a protocol of communication of positive results. So I think even for the private sector that are doing the testing, the numbers have to be reported to the national surveillance team. And particularly for positive results, I think we really have to look at what does a positive test mean? You must identify the contact, you must identify where that person is, you must mitigate the risk of spread of disease. So I think that's one of the gaps that currently uh, exist so that if I self-present and go to a private facility for testing, I can stay with my COVID status, I can put my loved ones at risk because I don't want them to know or things like that. So there has to be a very clear ch channel of communication and relaying of these positive uh, results. And also again, the, 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 the negative results again, what we have to all remember in an outbreak that is still unfolding, a negative result is not a negative result permanently. Somebody can be negative today and can be exposed tomorrow and can turn positive. So somebody being negative today has to take the responsibility of remaining negative by the social distancing measures that have been put in place. So we should not all think that because we are negative today we'll be negative permanently. Because if you put yourself in that situation where you are exposed, you can actually get uh, the disease. And we've even seen in China, some patients who are positive can still get reinfected. So I think that also we have to uh, remember that. All right. Thank you. The final comment is from Professor Ogola. Oh, oh sorry. Thank Let you. me just make one comment oh, sorry, before sir. Prof asked the question. So somebody asked about what is the projection. Yes. Um, so one, uh, there is some modeling work that we've done. But I think any modeling at this point has to be taken with certain caveats. Mm -hmm. One, it may under or overestimate. It may underestimate if, for example, you know, there are a lot of questions have been asked about could there be cases in the community that have been missed. So if there are cases that have not been picked, then it will underestimate our um, uh, projected figure. On the other hand, it may overestimate because models often take into account that you've not done anything to mitigate. So, for example, we'll draw a graph that says on this day we saw so many cases and based on this, uh, this is the number of cases we would see. But remember, in that period, people have been tested, they've been quarantined, they've been isolated, contacts are being traced. So if all those things are put in place, they may change the direction of the curve and a model done now may not pick that. So any modeling figures that we have are more to help with planning rather than to uh, spread any fear about what may happen. And you notice that was a very long way of not telling you the projected <laughs> thing. So we get to the last question now. Yes. So the last comment, sorry team, we'll, we'll have to take just the last comment from Professor Ogola, Eric Ogola. And uh, his comment is, thanks Lois and Mary Beth. I think you put the mask question in good perspective. Could you put that in the various doctors groups? I also think there's need there needs some structured communication with the medical community. There's both frustration and ignorance out there. So thank you all. We, are, we really apologize if we are not able to answer your questions. 
we tried. We've exceeded our time by 26 minutes. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lisa Cheng. Thank you, Mary, Dr. Maritin, for this session. And thank you for your time and your input. And thank you for the great work that you're doing. The IDU team was also logged in. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to get to hear their frontline experience. But asante ni sana. Tomorrow, we'll be having a session on COVID in pediatrics, still by another team of experts. So karibu ni sana. Log in tomorrow, 2 to 3 p.m. Thank you. Oh, that line was in their thing. Oh, so the application. <laughs> Somebody maybe touched that thing. Yeah. Okay. So we can yeah, we can leave. Mute.